calories in, calories out. That model for weight loss. Do you, yeah, your your thoughts on that? Your thoughts on that, Tommy? So, so, um, I, so, so I think the current iteration of the energy based model as has, you know, there's been this, back, people are probably aware there's been this back and forth between David Lugwig and, and Kevin Hall and their, their various cronies over the, the, the two, you know, sort of prevailing models of, of uh, energy metabolism and obesity. I think the current iteration of the energy, ba- the energy based model from Kevin Hall is the one that's closest to the truth. Um, I think, yes, calories in and calories out are an important factor, but you also have to take into to account that calories from different foods, from different macronutrients affect the energy out in different ways by affecting physiology and society and physical and, you know, non-energy, non-energy, acti- non-exercise activity, thermogenesis, all that kind of stuff. So I think that calories matter, but you have to take into account how different calories from different sources affect the whole system and affect physiology. And I think the most modern versions of that model do do that. So that's where I, if I had to stake my, my claim, that's where I would stake it. Can you expand on that a little bit? I just so people understand what you're talking about. Are you talking about macronutrients? Are you talking about different types of fat? Because I think that at least in rota models, like we talked about, there's some concern that certain types of fat may affect satiety differently. You were, I guess you could start with macronutrients. And then if you want to break it down within macronutrient categories, I'm interested in that too. So, so I think... Um... I think macronutrients is is definitely the best place to start. So so the things like um we we know, quote unquote know that protein is probably the most satiating of the macronutrients that also has a higher th- uh, thermic effect. So even though it technically has the same number of calories per gram as carbohydrates, that doesn't really translate into the same number of calories that's sort of like available for utilization by the body because of the thermic effect and then it is probably more satiating. So individual macronutrients can have different effects on satiety. Um, We also know that a plain, right? So everybody talks about the fact that a plain boiled potato is the most satiating food um, of any that's ever been tested because it's hard to eat and it's boring to eat. So, right, how many boiled potatoes with no salt or anything on could could any one individual eat in one one setting? Not very many, right? So, so, So they are quite satiating. Uh, so, so it depends on both the macronutrient, but then also the food context and then how that food is seasoned and flavors and all that kind of stuff as well. Um, in terms of w- within macronutrients, say, there are some data to suggest that um, when you, so say, let, let's focus on carbohydrates. If you, if you process carbohydrates that they have, they, in, on average, you can't, nowadays, we know that any individual, you can't predict how they'll respond in terms of their blood sugar to a, to a certain carbohydrate containing food. But on average, if you sort of process, so say you take a grain and you grind it down and you boil it and then you eat it compared to eating that sort of like whole grain cooked, you know, the true whole grain, you get a much larger blood sugar spike from the latter, from the former, sorry. And so when, when you process food, you start to um, dissociate the macronutrient and calorie content from the normal physiological responses that we may have elicited when we were eating that food in its minimally processed form hundreds or thousands of years ago. And if you have a large blood sugar spike, it's more likely to lead to a rapid drop of blood sugar later on. And then the speed of that drop and then the the degree that it drops seems to then drive hunger earlier, later on. So if you if you eat a carb, you know if you cause very large swings in blood sugar, that seems to increase hung, you know hunger earlier later on for the same number of calories. And there are some recent um, studies with um, continuous blood sugar monitoring that that show that. That's probably just like a small effect, but you know these things kind of add up. In terms of say different fats and how they affect satiety, I don't think we have really good evidence in humans. Again, we can go to the we can go to um, mechanistic data, the F to N ratio, so FADH2 to NADH production, which is different depending on the saturation level of, of the fat. That affects um, uh, how, you know, it affects reactive oxygen species signaling in the mitochondria that made feedback to the to insulin receptor, which can then uh, affect satiety again. And this like very mechanistic, 
seems to seems to explain what we see in mice. When we do overfeeding studies in humans, where we very specifically make the fat either polyunsaturated linoleic acid or saturated fat, we don't seem to see that difference. However, it's been done in the context of a mixed diet. So, you, you know, so like the muffin study in Sweden. So it's the fat in a muffin. If it was pure, I think it was either palmitic acid or linoleic acid. It didn't seem to have an effect either on satiety or the amount that people ate. Um, so, but that's in the context of a mixed diet. If you were sort of isolating it even more, I, I, you know, there's a possibility of an effect, but I don't think we've really seen a strong signal in humans in the studies that have been done so far. Have you seen the study? It's in one of the nature journals with stearic acid where they had vegans and they deprived them or they made people, they had people eat a vegan diet for a few days. They deprived them any stearic acid. Then they gave them a shake with a large amount of stearic acid and saw changes in mitochondrial function or at least fusion. And they saw uh, changes in beta oxidation markers. Have you seen that one with stearic acid? I thought that one was particularly interesting. Yeah, I think so. I read it when it came out. Was it a couple of years ago now? Two or three I think years ago? so. I haven't read it since then, but I do, I do remember reading it. I just found that interesting that I just found that interesting that stearic acid had that specific effect. And I, I think that what I'm curious about is just like we're talking within macronutrient groups, within, especially within the fats, are there certain fats that have pseudo hormonal effects in the human body and can affect things differently than other fats? Assuming that we're at nine calories per gram for all of them. That's an interesting question for me. Yeah. And I mean, it is possible. Uh, but you have to remember that these sort of short-term mechanistic outcome studies don't necessarily tell you anything about how things integrate long-term and then result in you know differential satiety, total calorie intake, body composition, long-term health outcomes. So again, this stuff is interesting, uh, but until we have a, a really good way to either randomize or assess different levels of stearic acid intake within individuals who are otherwise similar to one another, um, I'm, I'm not really sure I could could say one way or the other. We, we touched on blood sugar. How do you think about that? Because there are many in the health community who get very worried about absolute levels of, of blood glucose. You and I have talked about glucose excursions from the mean um, in the past and, and blood glucose variability, other metrics. How do you think about blood sugar? I think you've probably worn a CGM in the past. Do you, do you worry about absolute levels of blood sugar spikes? Um, is, do you believe there's a ceiling that we should not exceed for blood sugar? Um, how do you think about this? So I think blood sugar can, you know, large spikes and frequent sites in blood sugar can have an impact on, on long-term health. Um, you know, there are some studies, again, sort of associational, but looking at um, MAGE, so mean amplitude of glycemic excursions and a uh, degree of atherosclerosis, uh, risk of diabetes. Um, and, you know, I, th I think there's a signal there. We, we don't understand it perfectly, uh, but, I, and, but there's also, you know, there's some data to suggest that, you know, very large and persistently elevated glucose may affect endothelial function, which then, you know, could start to contribute to the process of atherosclerosis. Um, you know, may also affect uh, blood brain barrier function, may, you know, uh, start to affect cells within the brain. So I, I think there's some potential for, for, for an issue there. Um, however, again, I, I think if we um, focus on some of the things that we mentioned earlier, body composition, movement, diet quality, I think a lot of that starts to fall out. Um, a CGM can be useful, but what I'm really concerned about now in sort of like the health focus communities is this we've essentially patholo we're pathologizing food um you know with a particular focus on blood sugar uh, because that's what we can measure and you can kind of see it right so you have your you have your favorite scientific uh or physician influencer on instagram and they're wearing their blood sugar monitor and they're they're telling you about this highly processed food that they're about to eat and they're already stressed about the blood sugar response that it's going to cause you know and they've, they've essentially created this like pathologic uh, association between certain foods and their health. And I would guess that the stress of worrying about that is probably worse than the blood sugar spike that you get from that meal, assuming that it's, it's happening intermittently. So what I'm seeing is what looks like disordered eating driven by blood sugar. Um, we also know that expectation drives blood sugar. So if you think you're going to have a bigger blood sugar spike because you ate more carbohydrate, you will have a bigger blood sugar spike. There are uh, studies done in diabetics by uh, Ellen Langer that have shown this, randomized uh, placebo-controlled studies. So, there's, so if you're wearing a CGM 
and you think this food is going to spike your blood sugar, you'll get a bigger blood sugar spike because you're expecting it. Um, so if you think blood sugar spikes are pathologic, then you're almost creating one for yourself uh, as part of that process. And I think that's, that's a potential problem. Um, if you're somebody who's in a position to use a CGM and you think you can get useful data, I would argue that you probably only need to use it for two to four weeks max. Um, and that's because most people eat the same thing again and again and again and again. And how you respond to individual foods is fairly uh, repeatable. So if you wanted to know, hey, how much does my blood sugar spike when I eat my local Costa Rican papaya? How many times do you need to do that before you know, right? Probably two or three times, and that's it. So I would argue that you could probably collect all the data and information you need in two to four weeks, and then you never need to look at a CGM again. Um, and you know, maybe it is, well, hey, bananas don't spike my blood sugar a lot, but papayas do. Um, so maybe you just eat fewer papayas, and you just know that. Um, you know, and there's a possibility that as uh, your health changes, your body composition changes, you get older, some of these responses may change. So maybe in two or three years' time, you need to do it again. We don't know yet. Um, we also, you know, if we're honest, we don't have any good prospective data that tells us how well, you know, blood sugar variability predicts long-term health outcomes. What we have is, if we look at your blood sugar variability right now, how does that associate with your current health? That's very different. So we don't know if we change thing, or we, there are there are only a few, uh, there are only a small number of studies, and I can talk about one. Uh, but we don't know if you sort of like intervene specifically focused on glucose. Does that have a meaningful effect on your long term health? We just don't know that. The one study where I have seen that done, and there, there may be others, is uh, in a Japanese study looking at dipeptide peptidase four inhibitors in type two diabetics. So these um, these drugs basically prevent the breakdown of incretins. Um, so you get improved uh, blood sugar regulation. It's just you know a similar effect to you know the GLP one, GIP agonists that are now really popular like semaglutide and tazepatide. And in this study, they showed that and it was in older individuals. Uh, basically, your mean amplitude of glycemic excursions was your best predictor of your current cognitive function, as measured on a mini mental state exam. And then two years later, after taking these uh, DPP four inhibitor drugs. Um, the more your um, glycemic excursions improved, so the, the spikes got smaller, the more your cognitive function improved. So this is in older individuals. They've improved their glycemic excursions, and then that's associated with improvement in cognitive function. Um, I think that's some, some nice evidence to suggest that, that maybe there's, there's, there's a link there. But of course, along with those improvements in glycemic excursions, you've also got improved uh, you know, you know, weight loss improved body composition, all that kind of stuff, which, which plays a role too. Uh, but that's probably the one study where I think they've looked at it longer, longitudinally and then looked at how that's associated with differences in various health metrics. Given someone like myself with a fasting insulin consistently below three micro IU per ml, do you think I need to worry about a postprandial blood sugar of 150 milligrams per deciliter? No. <laughs> okay. Simple answer. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, 150 is that that gives that gives physician influencers who are focused on glucose a heart attack. I think. You know, I think you know, in somebody who's very healthy, if your fasting blood sugar is between 80 and 95, maybe even 100, and your mage is less than 50, um, right? So maybe you're going from 100 to 150. I'm not convinced that that uh, that that's going to be pathologic. And just so people know that mage is the glucose excursion. So it would, be, it would be the amount that your glucose moves from your average baseline to the apex of the postprandial spike in the glucose. Yeah. So it's the so if you if you think about each individual spike, mm -hmm. and then across the day, and then you would average those spikes to get the mean amplitude, so the mean height of the spike. So yeah. So say okay. you eat three meals a day. Each you go from your whatever your baseline is, it goes up by fifty each time. Then your mage would be fifty. But if it was like it went up fifty and then forty and thirty, then your mage would be forty, which is the average of the three. Okay, forty is the average. Uh, in, the in, in that in that in that specific scenario. Right, right. And if somebody wants to look at the mage, say they have a CGM. Do you have a metric that you use a fifty or something like that? Yeah. So. Um, if if I thought that you were high risk, and there's some data to suggest this, then I think that 
you should target a mage less than 40, maybe less than 30. If you're very low risk and you know everything else looks great and you know you have a CAC score of zero and you have good body composition and sleep well and all that, you know, all that kind of stuff, then I, I would suggest maybe a, a limit of, of 50 or 60 would probably be fine. Mm 